Let's turn into our Bibles to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. In the first verse, the Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, God had a message for Ezekiel. And God has a message for us too. Why are we studying this matter of the battle of Gog and Magog when we must understand that it's coming soon in the, in the latter days, the Bible says. The Bible says that it's going to happen just before the rapture or just afterwards. I'll share that scripture with you in a moment, which I believe shows that. So we can understand and as we see these things happening, as we see all these nations aligning and all the armies of the world coming to go against Israel, we'll know that the time is near. Last week we heard the rattling of the bones of Israel's birth from the vision of the valley of the dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37, speaking to us that in the latter days Israel would become a nation. And so we see that chapter 38 and 39 follow chapter uh, 37, speaking that this battle is going to happen after Israel as a nation. So we have to understand that it has to happen sometime after 1948. And it hasn't happened so far yet in our lifetime, and yet it is told that it was going to come against the nation of Israel. Israel is a nation today. And it came in 1948, so therefore this battle is in the last days, and you and I could see it's forming right now. This week and next week, we're going to hear the rattling, not of the bones of Israel, but of the swords of Israel's enemies. And our message tonight, this great battle, this battle of Gog and Magog, is not the War of Independence in 1948. It's not the battle of the Sinai War in 1956 or the Six-Day War in 1967 or the Yom Kippur War in 1973 or the Lebanon War in 1982 or even not the present uh, Intifada War of Terrorism today. It's a battle yet to come. It may be one that we see or one right after the rapture. But it is indeed coming. Ezekiel turned, begins his chapter with the word of the Lord came to me. It is God's solemn declaration. It is God's pronouncement that this battle is going to come. And this battle again may be in our time. We may see this battle coming upon the face of Israel. The first thing we want to look at, let's start with verse 2 and go to verse 6, we're going to see the identification of God's indignation. In verse 2, the Bible says, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your armies, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, from the far north and its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready and you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. We see, first of all, in verses 2 through 4, the anger of God. Psalm chapter 90 and verse 11 says, Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. Now there's a reason why I believe that this battle might take place just after the rapture. One of the reasons why I believe, and we'll talk about a few others during the time of the sermon, but one reason I believe is because of the rapture, I believe that America is going to be decimated. 
You think about all the Christians are in this country, all the, the people in positions of authority, all the military people, all the people in the police, all the people in all areas of, of government, whether it be local, state, or federal. And all these people are going to be missing. They're going to be gone. They're going to be taken. I believe the military is going to be decimated and we're going to be open and we're going to be vulnerable to the enemies of America. And I believe that Russia, as we're going to see in a moment, Russia is going to take its, make its move to make itself once more the, uh, the supreme superpower of this world. And I believe the first thing it's going to do is go against Israel. Israel will be all by itself because America will not defend it in that, in that condition. We see in verse 2 the person of his anger. The indication of this person is simple. God says his name is Gog. Now Gog is not necessarily a personal name. It may indicate, many Bible students believe, it may indicate his position or even his role of leadership in his country that he's going to be. The indication of his place is simple. He says is Gog of Magog, of the land of Magog. Well, if you look in your map, you won't find that in, in today's world. There is no country called Magog, and there is no leader today identified by the name of Gog. But historically speaking, Bible students have identified Magog as the land of Russia. Doctors Thomas McCall and, uh, and uh, Zola Levitt in their book, The Coming Russian Invasion of Israel, has said that the most farthest nation up to the north from right from Israel, you can take a line from Jerusalem and go straight up, and it goes right to Moscow. And that country, the far north country, is the furthest north on the, on the planet, is Russia. They wrote the names Gog and Magog are a bit cryptic. But it's not difficult to trace just who is meant here. Serious students of the Bible have identified Russia with these names long before she achieved her present supremacy. The New Schofield Reference Edition of the Bible states the reference is to the powers in the north of Europe headed by Russia. The attempt to exterminate the remnant of Israel in Jerusalem. They're going to come and try to destroy Israel. We see the person of God's anger. And then we see the personification of God's anger. In verse 3, look at his, his pronouncement of vindictiveness. In verse 3, the Bible says, And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. We see the pronouncement of his vindication. By the way, many people believe that Meshach is a, a, an ancient name for Moscow, and Tubal is also an ancient, ancient name for Tobisk. And so we see this pronouncement of God. God will avenge Russia's years of persecution, years of pogroms, years of godless policies regarding his people, the Jews. The Russians were horribly cruel to the Jewish people who were there in their land. Deuteronomy 32, 35 says that the Lord says, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. God says, Vengeance is mine. God says, I'll take care of that nation that abused you. I'll take care of that country and those people who maligned you, who spoke horribly of you, who treated you like animals. We see the pronouncement of God's vindictiveness. He said, vengeance is mine. In verse 4, we see the prediction of his victory. The Bible says, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with buckler's shield, and all of them handing, handingly, excuse me, handingly swords. God says, I'm going to move them out of their country. I'm going to bring them down to, to Israel. I'm going to bring them, but what he's bringing them to is not a victory. What he's bringing them to is a trap. 
He's bringing the Russian army and his confederacy, which we'll see in a moment. He's going to bring them down to Israel, and there they will be buried in the land. We're going to see in a few weeks, the Bible says it's going to take them seven months to bury the dead. There's going to be such a huge catastrophe on this part that these people are going to be one-sixth of the army is going to survive. So we see that God is going to bring vengeance upon this Russian people and upon this army and upon this nation. In verse 4, we see also the prediction of his victory. He says, I'm going to bring them down, all right, but I'm going to bring them down to destroy them. In verse 5 and 6, we see the allies of Gog. Who are these people that are going to come with Russia? Who are these people who are going to align themselves and supply their armies and their troops and their munitions and their trucks, their tanks, their planes? We see in verse 5 and 6 the roster of their alliance. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. We see the roster of his alliance. We're going to see what they all have in common in a moment. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Beth Togarma. Some of these names we recognize. Some of these names we do not recognize. Some of them are ancient names. We see in verse 5 and 6 the recognition of their association. Who are these armies? Who are these nations that are going to come down with Russia? Well, first of all, we see Persia. Persia it, it takes in the countries of Iraq and Iran. Those was where the Persian government was basically headquartered there in Iran. Ethiopia, some people believe also it might be Ethiopia or it could be the Sudan. They're in Africa. They're going to come up from the south. Persia, Iran and Iraq are going to come from the east. Libya is Libya. They're on the other side of Egypt. They're in northern Africa. They're going to come from the west. And in Gomer, the Slavic countries of Europe, those countries that were near Russia, at one time, they were a part of the Soviet Union, but when it crashed, they began their own uh, uh, nations. And then finally, Beth to Garma, where is that at? That's Turkey. You know, for many years, Turkey was an ally of Israel. But it wasn't until the 1990s that, is, uh, that Turkey turned against Israel. We see the one thing that all of these nations have in common, Persia and Ethiopia and Libya and Gomer and Beth Garma, is that today they are all Islamic allies with Russia. You know, some of these countries are right there in Syria. Many of them today are right there. They have uh, places of, uh, of uh, encampment right there on the border of Israel. I've often, in years when I was teaching and preaching this, this matter of the Gog War, that I began to think about how can they, with all the sophisticated devices we have today, how can it be such a surprise as uh, chapter 38 and 39 speak about when they're so far away with all the devices we have today, the radars, the satellites, how can this happen? They're right on their border. They're encamped right there. Many of them have uh, their, their places right there on the border. Israel's fighting Iran right now because of, of their, their border. They have them placed in encampments there upon their border, and they'll run and, and literally attack them and bomb them there and, as they had bombed them in northern Israel. We see a time of preparation, a time of prophecy. And a time of presentation in verses 7, 8, and 9. We see the incentive of Gog's invasion in verses 7 through 17. Why would Russia want to do this? We see in verse 7 through 9 of the prediction of God. 
Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. We see a time of preparation. Prepare yourself. Make yourself ready. I have a book in my library that's entitled Magog Canceled 1982. There in the Lebanon, Lebanon War, when Israel went up into Lebanon there to, to attack uh, the uh, different uh, Muslim groups there to give themselves some, some breathing room from the north, they came across some caves that had been dug by machinery. And in those caves, they had found Russian munitions. They found Russian uniforms. They found Russian uh, uh, uniforms and, and all kinds of material to use for, for a war. They took them and, and showed them on on uh, television and literally sold them all. And the second, they said the second largest uh, uh, seller of Russian munitions in the world was Israel. They had sold it all. And so what this author that wrote this book said that Russia had prepared, had had all this stuff underground, waiting for the troops to come in and get the material they needed. Folks, listen, I am telling you, this has been going on for some time. Even during the wars of Israel, Russia was helping the Arabs, giving them, giving them uh, advice, helping them to know how to fly the planes. In fact, there are those who believe that in the Yom Kippur War, Russia was flying MiGs to, to fly sorties there into Israel during the time of the Yom Kippur War. Russia, for some reason, has a desire for Israel. I believe that desire is monetarily, is monetarily, and, and also believe it's spiritual. I believe Satan has filled their heart with a desire to destroy the Jewish people. Why? Why would the devil want to destroy the Jewish people? It's very simple. If you can destroy the Jewish people, there will be no return of Jesus. Because you think about this, Jesus is going to return at the end. He's going to come at the end of the tribulation period in a time it's called the Battle of Armageddon, and he's going to rescue the remnant of the Jewish people. He's going to come and establish the kingdom. He's going to destroy the Antichrist. He's going to have Satan bound, put into the, the uh, uh, pit, and for a thousand years have the kingdom. So how could Satan thwart that? How could he fight against it? Oh, it would be simple. One thing he'd only have to do, get rid of the Jewish people. And Jesus would have no one to come and rescue. So why would Jesus want to come to this earth and establish the kingdom? And so we see that Satan here, all these years since the Garden of Eden, have tried to destroy the Jewish people. Oh, we see when Abraham went on, the, went into Egypt, he went down there, and lo and behold, Joseph was sold eventually later on down, and they went in there as slaves, came out as a nation. Satan was doing everything he could to destroy the Jewish people. So his plan hasn't stopped. And so now he sees the raptures happen, the Christians are taken out of this world, both Jew and Gentile. And so Satan says, let's, let's take care of this. We'll start this tribulation period off with destroying the Jews, and I will make this world mine. And so we see that he's going to place in the heart of, of, of the, this Gog character a desire to, to destroy the Jews. In verse 7, we see a time of preparation. Gog's attitude, his allies, and his advance was simple. Gog would be leading the troops for the battle, the Bible says in verse 7, and be a guard for them. Guard was those out front. They were the ones running forward. They were the ones out in front of the, of the troops. And we see the Russians are going to be the main antagonists of this. They're going to get all of these Islamic countries and all these Islamic armies to follow them and to go into battle. They're going to tell these Islamic armies, you have tried in the past, but you were not successful. But you let us help you, and we'll destroy them. 
And they'll go into the land with this group, this, this army of Islamic, uh, of Islamic people. We see in verse 7 a time of preparation. In verse 8 we see a time of prophecy. After many days you will be visited in the latter years. That latter years means the last days. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. We see here in verse 8, the Bible says, in the latter years. Again, the latter years speaks of the last days. And most Bible students identify that the last days began in 1948. That when Jesus came into this world as the Messiah, when he lived and breathed and walked and talked and taught in the land of Israel, the Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not. They would not receive him as their Messiah, which means they would not receive him as the king. And that's why Pilate, when Pilate crucified him, he crucified him as the king of the Jews because that's what he'd said he'd come to be. And so we see that from that point on, we see that the prophetic clock stopped. It began in Daniel and talked about the coming of the Messiah there in Daniel. And when the Messiah came, there were so many years, so many days to the exact time when Jesus came into the, uh, the city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. He was there to present himself as the king, as the Messiah. And from that point there, the prophetic clock stopped. It went on hold, so to speak, for the church. And the church now has been almost 2,000 years now, and we have been in this time bringing the gospel of Jesus to this world. Eventually, our church age will close. Eventually, the rapture will come. Eventually, the Christians will be taken out and the Jews will be once more the, the, the main party of God's people in this world. We see that Satan is going to try to stop that. That clock is ticking right now since 1948 when Israel became a nation. Once more, that the Bible students will tell you, that began the prophetic clock once more. I like the way a Jewish uh, preacher years ago, I, my father-in-law had him at his church and we uh, sat in this session and he talked about the, the nation of Israel as being a locomotive that had been taken off the tracks and put into uh, the, the, uh, uh, the place where they repair the trains and for almost 2,000 years that train has been worked on and protected and taken care of Whereas the new train, the train of the church, was taking the gospel throughout all the world. But when that train is removed, that train is going to come out once more and going to lead the world into belief of God and to trust in Christ. We see in verse 7 this preparation. We see in verse 8 a prophecy. We see in verse 9 a time of presentation. You will ascend, coming like a cloud, a storm, excuse me, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Oh, beloved, there are going to be literally hundreds of thousands of men come and women come on this, on this great battle. There's going to be unbelievable amounts of people. They're going to do this and do it as quickly and as fast and as effective as they can. They said, we're tired of all these little battles, these little wars we have fought over and over again. We have brought ten times the troops in, and each time Israel has overcome us. And now we're just going to do it and get it over with. We see a coordinated and a swift, surprising attack, much like the Yom Kippur War. When Israel was there in a time of fasting, there they were at the time of the beginning of the Yom Kippur, the highest holy day of Israel, when all of Israel was fasting and in prayer, and they attacked Israel. They almost 
completed their task. But there is a God in heaven who loves the Jewish people. There's a God in heaven who has next to him his son who was born of a Jewish virgin. And he protected them in that battle. Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 9, I believe this battle is going to happen perhaps just after the rapture. Ezekiel 39, turn over just a little bit to your right in Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 9. The Bible's talking about having them recover, the land of Israel recovering after God destroys these great armies. The Bible says in verse 9, Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and arrows, the javelins and spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. Why would God use that term of seven years? Why not six years? Why not three years? Why not two years? Why would God mean that they would have enough fuel to carry them through a seven-year period if it was not concerning this time of the tribulation? You see, you have in, verse, in chapter 37 the birth of Israel as a nation. In chapter 38 and 39, you have this battle of Gog and Magog and from chapter 40 to the end of Ezekiel, you have the new temple that's going to be here in this world during the time of the kingdom. Why would it not be those seven years that it's speaking of in chapter 39 be speaking of the tribulation period? And if that be true, we see a great battle that begins the tribulation period, the battle of Gog and Magog, and we see a great battle that Jesus comes and you and I are going to go with him to come back to the earth there at the battle of Armageddon. And they're going to do great battles. So the beginning of the tribulation starts with a great battle and the close of the tribulation starts or ends with a great battle. And so we see that this time of presentation is coming and it may be coming soon, beloved. In verse 10 and verse 11, <clears throat> we see the provocation of Gog. In verse 10, we see an evil scheme is devised. If this is true, if we're living in the last days and this is going to happen soon, Gog of Magog, if it would happen tomorrow, Gog would be Mr. Putin. And there we see that this man has already been rattling his saber all over the world, has he not? He's been making all kinds of, of uh, indications that he wants to do battle. He wants to do all these issues of things. In verse 10, the Bible gives us a very interesting insight in this, this Gog. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. Oh, the thoughts will arise. You know, there are people right now today that are trying to figure out how they can overcome and, and destroy the world. There are people today who desire to take over the world, to make everything in this world like them that they could control the entire world. We've had despot leaders for centuries. In Jesus' time, it was a Pax, a Pax Romanus, which is a piece of Rome. In the time of Jesus, when he was alive, the Roman Empire was a peaceful empire. But, oh, beloved, before that time, it was a brutal empire. Afterwards, after Jesus died and went to an ascend, resurrected and ascended to heaven, the Roman Empire again became a great brutal empire. And we see its destruction finally. And from that point on, we have seen these, these leaders come up, uh, Napoleons and, and Hitlers and Mussolinis and Stalins and Pol Pot and all these people who throughout all the years have come upon the scene, who have tried to take the world and try to overcome us. And we see this evil scheme is devised. Where did this thought come from? Where did this 
come to his mind perhaps in the nighttime on his bed or perhaps in his office somewhere or even in some council somewhere. They began to devise the plan. We're going to destroy the Jewish people. Where did it come from? Turn in your Bibles to the word, to the Bible, uh, to the book, excuse me, of Proverbs. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter six. Proverbs chapter 6, and start with verse 12. A worthless person, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes, he shuffles his feet, he points with his fingers. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord, therefore his calamity shall come suddenly. Suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. Oh, this speaks of this great Gog of Magog. He's a treacherous man. He's an evil man. He has a thought to do evil things. So where does these thoughts come from? It could come from his own heart. It could come from Satan himself who speaks and whispers in the ear of this, this ugly and perverse leader who's going to come and make war against Israel. It could be God himself who puts this in the mind of this man so that he can take care of this invader. We see in verse 11, his evil scheme is determined. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. I like the way the NIV puts it. It says, I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people. Israel is not going to expect this. They're not going to think about this. You know, years ago, Moshe Dayan, General Moshe Dayan, was asked who was he more concerned about? What nation, what Arab nation was he concerned about? He said, our next war is going to be with Russia. That's who I'm concerned about. We see that, yes, that, that many people are keeping their eye on Russia. What if God would give this Russia government this opportunity to come upon the scene? And what if God would put this, this plan in this man's mind? In verse 12 through 16, we see why Gog will attack Israel. There's many reasons why. There, there are purposeful reasons why they're going to do it other than the actual spiritual thing, other than the fact that Satan is going to cause him to do it or the fact that God may desire for him to do it. We see in verse 12 and 13 a plunderous incentive. In verse 12, the Bible says to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. We see Gog's personal motive. You know, Russia has not been that big of a, of a, a world power for a long time. Perhaps this COVID thing, this pandemic that's been going on in the world is devastating countries, devastating nations, causing great, great upheaval in, in the aspect of the economics. Perhaps this will be the motive of Gog as he desires to go down to collect that which Israel has. Perhaps they want a seat there in the Middle East to connect with the oil. Not everybody's going to be doing electric cars, you know. Perhaps he's going down there into that land to get, get a tap into the oil reserves there in, in the Middle East. Or perhaps the natural gas that Israel has found off its coast. We see its plunderous incentive. In verse 13, we see Gog's perceived motive. What are the nations going to think about this? In verse 13, the Bible says, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, 
and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? You know, they would not have thought that if that country or that leader had not had economic problems. That wouldn't even cross their mind if they were not sure or they had not heard or they had not known that this country had some economic problems. Once again, I tell you, this, this pandemic that's going around, this pandemic that's, that's literally engulfing the globe, we see that many occasions it's destroying the economy of people. So perhaps this is an issue that will cause Gog to go down. Sheba, by the way, is Saudi Arabia. Dedan is Yemen. Tarshish, there are some people who believe it's Spain, but I believe it's somewhere near the Arabs. Perhaps again, Gog is in a financial pinch, and Israel's destruction will put him in good with the oil-rich nations. Perhaps it's just that they want to, to have a seat there in that place of the Middle East. In verse 14 and 15, we see a political incentive. We see a, a personal incentive, perhaps to gain more money, to get control of the, the resources there in the Middle East. But also in verse 14 and 15, we see the political incentive. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel Dwell safely, will you not know it? What does he mean by that? We see an animosity they have for the existence of Israel. They know that Israel's there. They know that no one can rock them out of that land. They know that God has put them in that land and they are not going to leave. And so therefore they must devise this great plan, this great army, this massive group of people to make a surprise attack on Israel and overcome it. We see that animosity they have to that nation. You do know that everyone and a lot of people in this, this world hate America. They hate for what, what we stand for. They hate what we have. And it's the same feeling they have about Israel. They hate Israel because that is the only democracy in that part of the world. We see a political incentive. We see an alliance of Israel's enemies in verse 15. The Bible says, Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. I remember years ago when I was young and lived in California there on the on the base. I was uh, stationed there and I used to go into Oceanside, California all the time. And I saw on the bookshelves a, a uh, book, brand new book had come out. It was called The Late Great Planet Earth. And I remember grabbing that book and leafing through and said, man, this looks good. So I bought it and took it back to the barracks. And I think I read it in about a day or two. I even put it in an envelope and sent it to my, at that time, my girlfriend, who later became my wife. In fact, right now, I've got that same book that I bought in my office. And basically, what was unique about that book, it was the first time I'd ever read a book of prophecy that made the Bible and the things of prophecy look like and read like a newspaper. And what Hal Lindsey talked about, all these horses and all these things, is this is what the, the prophet had to use because he had no idea what these things were. And they sounded like the horse hoofs running and moving as they came across the land. And we see the political incentive, we see the pious incentive in verse 16 and 17, and this is what really, I think, puts the icing on the cake. Look at verse 16. We see that this pious incentive for this great battle is the hand of the Lord. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, You will come against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land, 
so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before your eyes. Oh, he can make all the schemes he wants. He can make all the plans he wants. He can think this is something that I've devised and I've got it right. And gentlemen, we're going to take care of the Jews this time. But oh, God has brought him to his death. God is bringing him to the great time uh, that God has placed that trap and going to spring it upon him. We see in verse 17, this pious incentive is to bring honor to God. Thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? There in verse 16, it says, when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. We're going to see in chapter 39 that the Bible says that God has said the people are going to know I did this. We see the rapture destroys the U.S. as a world power and God will destroy Russia who will make an attempt to fill that vacuum. The two great powers besides the United States is Russia and China. China is a part of that great conglomeration in the book of Revelation called the Kings of the East. And we see that there are only going to be two places that the Bible talks about in the last days. It's going to be talking about Europe and the army of the Antichrist, and it's going to talk about the kings of the East and their army. There's no mention of Russia. There's no mention of the United States. And what we see is this is where Russia is going to come to its fall. How soon could this happen? Any time after May 14th, 1948. The allies of Gog are politically in place. All of these people we mentioned over in, in the scriptures, they are all allied with Russia today. The sabers of Israel's enemies are rattling. They're there right now in Syria, located there with a small contingent group that can be those first groups that attack, and the rest would be following with them. And the world is posturing itself for an invasion. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 20 and 21, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, John writes, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Oh, beloved, I believe that Jesus and the angels of heaven are there at the gates of heaven waiting for the go-ahead by God to come. I believe the rapture is right around the corner. If that, true, if that is true, then the battle of Gog and Magog is very near. No, at this moment, there are people without Christ, loved ones and friends who are without Jesus who will be left behind. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? How about your family? You say, preacher, I'm ready. My wife is ready. I'm ready, but... Uh, what about your family? What about your friends? Are they ready for the rapture? One of the saddest things I've ever read is that those who will be left behind after the rapture, what a tragedy, what a world they're going to have to face. Nothing like we face today. Oh, beloved, it, it is truly sad to see, but this battle is coming and it's coming very soon. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for its truth. And we thank you, Father, for its prophecy and for its giving us a warning. Be with us tonight, Father God, as we come to this moment of decision. If there be anyone here tonight without Christ, let them come to Jesus tonight. Let them come forward to receive Christ and we will show them in the Bible how they can receive him or they can pray right now to receive him. For those watching on, on YouTube and those watching on Facebook and those who are here tonight, Father God, help them to understand these basic principles of the need of salvation. Help them to understand, Father, that we're all sinners. We're born that way. We're all in that same boat and the tragedy is the boat is sinking. 
Some of us in the boat have life preservers, and his name is Jesus. And, oh, Father God, be with those who have come to that point. They want Christ as their Savior. Help them to understand they're sinners, but that Jesus came to die for their sins upon that cross and rose from the dead to give them life everlasting. If they'll but confess their sins and repent of their sins and ask Jesus to come into their heart, they can be saved. Oh, Father God, let them pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I realize that you're a savior. You're your son of God. You're the son of God who came to die for my sins. I confess my sins. I repent of my sins. And Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness on the cross. I thank you, Lord, that you were buried and you rose from the dead to give me life everlasting. I believe this. And now I open the door of my heart, Lord, and ask you to come into my life and save my soul. And Jesus, to the best of my ability, I'll live the rest of my life for you. If you prayed that prayer just now, Lord, help them. Those who prayed that prayer, Father, help them to make that public, that make their decision public. They might tell a family member, a friend, or even come during a church service to make that, that decision known. Whatever be done tonight, Father, in this moment, in this place, let it be done for your honor and your glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.